Hey, this is Matt once again. We're about to another re review. This is another paid request. This time for Philip. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, topics, reactions, reviews, re-reviews, randomness, out of blueness, whatever it may be, uh, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. It have to be a review, commentary, ranking list, reaction, movies, video games, pretty much whatever. Feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links down below in the info box. This is for the 1985 film Enemy Mine. Now, Enemy Mine is a film I haven't seen in a long, long while. Came out. I said 1985, and it was a bomb. The studio thought it would be a decent sized hit. And. How do I put it? The, the making of the film is interesting. Because there was a different director. It wasn't Wolfgang Peterson who would go on to direct the film. Wolfgang Peterson, who did Das Boot, Never Ending Story. He would go on to direct In the Line of Fire, Air Force One. Outbreak. Those three films I really enjoy. So he's a good director. But they had a different director who I guess Dennis Quay at one point in an interview said that director wanted to make a more gritty version of this film. But the producers in the studio did not like the dailies. They said, well, the settings, it just looks like Earth. It just looks like Earth and there's nothing really alien about this world there's there's no they just were not impressed in the slightest and by this point 17 million dollars had been spent and then the studio said well we gotta fire this guy so what are we gonna do are we gonna strap it or keep going well we got Dennis Quaid we got Louis Gossett Jr. we got got to pay them no matter what we want to have something for, I think it came out around the Christmas season. Hey, Wolfgang Peterson, I think Wolfgang finished Never Ending Story and then did this. I guess it's based on a novel. I don't know how the novel, what's different, what's the same with it. And so the budget, because... When you add in that seventeen million, you add this budget and marketing, it went to like over forty million dollars. Like it was a lot bigger budget than they planned on it, and did not nearly make its money back. It became a big box office flop. I would say it kind of hurt Dennis Toy's career because he had Dreamscape in eighty four. He had this in eighty five. So you had two sci-fi films that didn't really do much of anything, box office-wise, were bombs. And then years later, he did Inner Space, which I love. Obviously, of those three, Inner Space, I think, is the best of the three, in my opinion. And that, that, that didn't do anything. So, you know, Dennis Quay is a good actor. He's an underrated actor. But studios looked at, wow, that's a bomb, that's a bomb, and that's a bomb. Let's not cast him in the lead and, and so many more movies. But the plot of the film, it's 2092, and there's a war between the humans and these lizard-like creatures called the Drax. And so we're in the midst of a battle. One of the Drax kills one of the shoots down one of the spaceships Dennis Quay is pissed off chases after them during the dog fight both of these ships crash on this planet and then the rest of the film is Dennis Quaid and then this alien played by Louis Gossett Jr. work together and it's supposed to be a story about intolerance and understanding and their enemies but then they have to work together and then they become friends and so forth watch this again I hate to say it this is a mixed bag 
this is a mixed bag. You know, if this was 10 years ago, I would have said this is a film due for a remake. But the way the movies are nowadays, a remake would just make it worse. It really would. Because the idea is there. Yeah, it might not be new. There was Hell in the Pacific with Lee Marvin. And there's the Defiant Ones with Sidney Poitier. Where you have two people opposite sides. They're bumping heads. And then the enemies become friends. But putting a sci-fi angle, I'm fine with. I mean, I love Outland. Outland with Sean Connery is my favorite Sean Connery film. Outland is a movie where you take High Noon, the Western, but you put it in outer space. Because you have Sean Connery as a marshal, and the third act, these bad guys are coming, instead of on the train, it's on the spaceship, no one's helping them, so he sets himself up for war. And let's love Outland. So I'm fine with taking no light. Taking an older idea and just put in like space, perfectly fine with that. And what makes the film watchable, other than I like some of these special effects, uh, some of the makeup, I believe Chris, Chris Whale has worked on the makeup, who worked on Gremlins and he directed The Fly 2, and also some of the special effects by ILM. There's some spotty stuff here and there, but the way the planet looked, it does make it look like an alien world. It doesn't just make it look like they just filmed it in a forest somewhere, or they just filmed it overseas, and that's it. It does make it seem like the feel of an alien planet. And you have some practical creatures that live on that planet. And Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr. make the film watchable. Their interactions with each other, how they talk to each other. Louis Gossett Jr. I liked as an actor. I liked him in The Punisher with Dolph Lundgren, uh, Toy Soldiers of Sean Astin, Iron Eagle. Always liked Louis Gossett Jr. He had won an Oscar for the film An Officer and a Gentleman with starring Richard Deere. But sadly, his career... Those films I mentioned, I liked, but they were never big. Well, Iron Eagle was a hit, but they were never as critically acclaimed compared to An Officer and a Gentleman. But yeah, I still love The Punisher, I still love Iron Eagle, Toy Soldiers. And funny enough, this is the second time they worked together, because they were together in Jaws 3 before this. So yeah, it's funny that you you have two guys from Jaws 3 and they're working together again. So that was kind of cool because I like Jaws 3. I do. I like Jaws 3. I think it's a fun movie. It's a flawed movie, but I think it's a fun film because of Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett. You know, anyway. It's one of those things, though, that despite their interactions... There's a lot of things that are off about the film, at least for me. Number one, it feels at times like a 1950s sci-fi film. I can't put my finger on it. Either it's like the beginning of the film where you see Dennis Quaid and his other comrades in these spacesuits, and the spacesuits look like the type of spacesuits a 1950s sci-fi film the astronauts were wearing those. And then, the way some of the things looked, like design-wise. Also, the music, I thought the music was, it wasn't terrible, it just wasn't impressive. It wasn't memorable. I mean, I know it's from a different film. But one of the like trails or TV spots, I kind of wish they used the music in that, in the in the movie. But that's from a different one. But yeah, the music in this, I don't know who did the music, but they needed like a Jerry Goldsmith. Like if you had someone like a Jerry Goldsmith working on it, 
But I think it was a guy that would go on to work on Jacob's Ladder, which I love that store. Maurice Jarre, I believe it was him. I could be wrong, because I don't remember who did the store, but just, maybe just this type of film just didn't fit. Uh, just the store, and yeah, I wouldn't say it's awful, it just, nothing I would ever listen to again, nothing I would ever, I could hum or replicate or even remember, honestly. I did find it funny that it's 2092, and then Quaid, he just had a, a regular looking pistol. I say, wow, we have all these spaceships and all this advanced technology, both weaponry, we got the typical pistol. But on the flip side, I can't really get mad at that because aliens, I mean, yeah, yeah, the pulse rifle, but like Gorman just had a pistol. And Outland with Sean Connery, he just had a shotgun, so I can't get mad at that. Yeah, there's a party that makes me think of Simon Phoenix. It's the future. Where are the phaser guns? But yeah, I mean, I'm not. I I don't get mad at that and Outland for it, so I'm not going to get mad at this for doing it. But like I said, the two actors they work well. Like when Louis Gossett Jr. saves Dennis Quaid and Quaid is going, why did you save me? And Louis Gossett Jr. is going, well, I need to look at another face, even one as ugly as yours. And I thought the way Gossett replicated, they just created this new language. And the way he did the voice and had to do these certain inflections of tone during the voice and the way he had to say certain words... It helped in the illusion of being an alien life form. Not just the way he looked, but just the way he talked, his cadence, all that. So I thought... He did a really solid job. But... This has a weird sense of time. Because there'd be one bit where... This Quaid, clean-shaven... Then, like, the next scene, he's got longer hair, and then, oh, okay, then by the time I'm registering it, two, three scenes later, now he's got longer hair, and he's looking like a caveman, I'm like, wait, what the hell? This is a weird, like, pacing to this. You know what this movie feels like? It feels like a movie that's going in slow motion, and then it hits the fast-forward button. Then it goes back to slow motion again. Then it hits the fast forward button again. Because there'll be times where there's certain scenes that are dragged out. And then fast forward, but, 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 but well, wait a minute, what, what happened? Wait, it's like three years. Or is it is it two years? Like, I know at the end you find out he's. Dennis Quaid's been on the planet for three years. But how much of that was with Louis Gossett Jr.? How much of that was with... Did you kind of find out Louis Gossett Jr.'s character, their species, they can give birth themselves? And so, Louis Gossett Jr.'s character dies, and Dennis Quaid... Yes, this is a spoiler, I'm sorry, it's a film from 1985. And then Dennis Quaid raises the kid as an uncle and then you have like a couple scenes and then boom they're rescued and it's like I just I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. it's really strange the sense of time in this it's like there should be moments that we should be taking more time to delve more into the characters between Quaid and Lewis and back and forth and them getting to know each other like this arc but then it's like some of that bits fast forward or it's like imagine a bit here but then this chunk's cut out this chunk's cut out this chunk's cut out and then we just play like that like think of it if you edit a video imagine you take your video and you edit like little snippets out you delete it and then you <sighs> I don't know what it, I don't know if it's stuff that was cut out from the original version of the film 
Because I know Wolfgang Peterson did not use any of that old footage. But maybe it was rewritten, reworked, make this faster, make this whatever. I don't know. Just again, the first. They probably crash land after all that. And when they crash, then it's them trying to find who's on the planet. Then meeting each other. Then they try to kill each other. Or at least Dennis Quaid tries to kill him. But Louis Gossett Jr. does not try to kill Quaid's character. Which I'm not sure why. I just, you know, because <laughs> there'd be no movie. And then. They say it has this weird pace into it. That has, again, some nice interactions. Dennis Quaid brings up Mickey Mouse. Of course, Louis Gass Jr. doesn't know what that is. So thinks that's something important. So when Dennis Quaid says something bad about his teachings, because his the alien race that Louis Gass Jr. is with is very religious-oriented. He gets offended by what Quaid says, so then he says to Quaid, well, your Mickey Mouse is one big stupid dope. And then Dennis Quaid almost busts la out laughing. Like, that's one of the best parts of the movie. The movie needed a lot more of those type of scenes. Where... I hate to say it, it needed to follow... If you remember really Scott's The Martian, which I rather liked... Where you see the step-by-step -step process of how Matt Damon survives on this planet. And yes, of course, there's time jumps, but you still see this gradual progression. This nat natural progression of him. I science the shit out of this. Find food, find water, power, loneliness, dealing with it. Using a sense of humor to overcome it. You see that build-up of it. And to me, that is what helps make that film successful. This, that progression is not natural. And that should have been more, whether in terms of new scenes to be added, or sometimes it's like meander, and it's like make it a bit more tighter. I don't know, just... This way, I don't know if it needs to be longer or shorter or something. I don't know. I can't quite put in the words. Like, okay, there's a bit where Quaid apologizes to Louis Gossett Jr. Then Louis Gossett Jr. gives him a necklace with a little book. I'm going to teach you some of my words. Then, like, the next bit, it's a long time later. And hair, beard... A little bit of conversation, and then boom, there's like big meteor shower, and then there's an attack that happens, and then Louis Dow Jr. is pregnant, and blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, show us some of this guy teaching Dennis Quaid, and Dennis Quaid teach him about Earth, and about some, I don't know, whatever Dennis Quaid's character is into. And then, I will say, uh, good morning spoilers, when Louis Gossett Jr.'s character dies, dies in childbirth, there's a little bit of a soul that's lost, because like it is those two, when the, they interact with each other, that is the, the bits of the soul of the movie. That's what makes the film, at least at time waste, or not some, a film I dislike. But when he's gone, and like I get the idea, and there's that part of me that doesn't mind the idea, because it shows that this is a guy, Dennis Quaid's character, that hated these creatures, but now he's raising one as an uncle. That shows the arc of that character, and again, more tolerant, understanding, loving of a species that not his own. I get that idea, I don't mind that idea, 
But then there's a part of me that's like, well, I was really liking Louis Gossett Jr. stuff. It's like, if you tighten that up, and if you... Certain things you grew upon, and you... You really went for the idea, and it was about them escaping... Like, if it was like a version of Castaway. Or some of these other films where it's about the escape of this planet. They work together. And... I don't know how it would end though. It kind of feels like a different movie. I think that's what it is. When it gets to the threat, it feels like a different film. It kind of feels like... It's like the first two-thirds of the film is trying to be this character movie of a, about understanding. And then the third act said, fuck you, we need to be an action film. And I'm an action junkie. I'm an action junkie. And even I'm going, I don't know if that was the right fit for this. Because it does raise questions. Because what happens is, as he's raising the kid, I don't know why no one ever tried to look for Dennis Quaid. You would think... With this battle going on and that they would be monitored, someone would know that he crashed on that fucking planet. Or they'd go, this guy went missing. It's been three years. Maybe we should try this fucking planet out and see. Nope. And then... There's people that are grabbing these aliens for slave labor... Brian James is one of our villains. Brian James, he was in the horror show with Lance Sanderson. He was in 48 Hours in the sequel. He was in Tango and Cash. He was in a lot of stuff. May he rest in peace. He was a good character actor. A lot of times playing the villain. The guy shoots Dennis Quaid like right in the chest. And enough time passes, to just, just think about this, enough time passes that he gets shot in the chest, he goes down, he's lying there, then thankfully other parties get there all of a sudden. I guess they saw what Brian James and them were doing and they were following them, I don't know, 100%. Then they get Dennis Quaid and then they certify him as dead. They put a toe tag on him. Like they checked his pulse. Nothing. And then when he's ready to be finally zipped up for. Like he's been, already been zipped up. Then. And he's alive. And it never explains how the fuck he's alive. How the fuck did he survive a gunshot like right here. Right now. <laughs> Maybe you learned it from 50 Cent. I don't know. 50 Cent went back to the future. No, he went... Well, this is 2092. 50 Cent used his finances of extra 50 cents. Go in the fucking future. They teach him this is how you survive a bullet. But he's just alive. Even though they survived him as dead. And then... There's question because he knows the alien dialect. Is he a traitor? Is he a spy? And then these three humans that I swear I haven't seen before. Is but they seem like they know Dennis Quay's character. They go, oh, you what are you talking about? That's Davich. I guess they took the word for him because Dennis Quaid is back on duty. And now he's clean shaven. I didn't it's like there's stuff missing. You would think, wait a minute, isn't there... Do you remember aliens? She gets found, and what happens? Conversation. A meeting. Because I blew out the goddamn airlock, like I said. Did IQs drop sharply when I was away? That whole business. And then they think that she fucked up, so she gets pretty much demoted to the, the shit list. Back to work in the docks. 
here, people think he might have been a spy, but he goes right back to being a fucking pilot. Clean shaven, no dialogue, no conversation. What happened on the planet? Let me, well, hey, you know, keep this. Nothing. He's able to take just a fucking spaceship easily and fly away. And then I guess those three humans follow him. Why do they follow him? I guess they... F just because they knew him in the past. I guess they knew him in the past. They flee. I guess they told us in the ten seconds of dialogue they had with each other. And then Dennis Quaid goes to a mine. Where his nephew, you know, his kid's supposed to be watching. Dennis Quaid fights and shoots a couple humans. The aliens see this go, whoa, what's going on here? And one of them helps Dennis Quaid out by shooting Brian James. That's what I mean, then it feels like a different movie. It feels like we're in a different film. I don't know, I just... I like the special effects... I think its heart was in the right place and what it was trying to do. I like Dennis Quaid, I like Louis Gossett Jr. But I think the movie needed to be entirely about them and I think you needed an overhaul of the script. You need an overhaul of the script and you need to have this actual progression of enemies, they're unsure of each other, then they're paranoid, then they have to work together, and like the movie's trying to do that, but it doesn't do that very successfully, in my opinion. Again, if you had two actors that was not Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr., this film would be a total flop. As in, it was a box office flop, but I just mean, I know it has a cult following, it wouldn't even have that. And... You know, of the 80s films, I love a lot of 80s films. I love The Last Starfighter. I love... I like Fly the Navigator. You know, I like Runaway with Tom Selleck. Hell, I love that film. I love, you know, The Terminator, Aliens, The Blob from 1988, John Carver's The Thane, Dennis Quaid, I love, you know, Inner Space, very fun movie. There's a lot of sci-fi films in the 80s I enjoy. You know, Star Trek films, most of the, of the Star Trek, at least in the 80s, I enjoy. Even 70s, because I like Star Trek the motion picture. But this... Uh, you know what's funny? This seems like it could have been a big budget episode of Star Trek. With Captain Kirk and a clean on in the same situation. There you go, it'd be Captain Kirk, William Shatter, and Christopher Lloyd in weird alternate Star Trek 3. Star Trek 3.5. But that's what it kind of felt like at times. And I was like, well, if there was an episode of Star Trek, maybe it would be better. Like I say, it's, it's sad because there's the two good actors, and the idea and the heart is in the right place. You had some nice ILM effects to create this alien world. It just, again, it's this weird... The script, I think the script is the issue, the, the pacing. Again, there's like things that feel like they're missing. And... I don't know if it was the production woes. I don't know. Wolf Team Peterson just got the job and then he couldn't work. Because he did... You look at what he's done after. Air Force One, In the Line of Fire, Outbreak, much better than this. So, I don't hate the film, but it's not a film I love. And like I said, if, if movies were worth a shit, I would go remake this film. But, they would fuck it up, so don't remake it. And I, you know, I, I even like the poster, as simple as it is. Which I know a lot of people, back to the day, and the marketing. Like, oh, this is a shitty poster. I'm like, well... It's simple, but I like the titles, enemy, and then mine in, is inside it. I actually don't mind the, the marketing. But, uh, I just don't think the movie is that impressive, Sally. 
It's a mixed bag. So, with that said, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.